Hello and welcome. This is a quick study. Sorry, this is getting to you late. I had a uh, uh, Max had a family. Uh, well, had a health emergency. He fell off the uh, fell off a cliff 35 feet on Monday. So we've been dealing with that. Thank you, God, that he's alive and that the angels are working overtime and no paralyzation or death. But he does have a broken elbow that's shattered and I had to get replaced and um, his other rest. So anyway, here is a quick Bible study. I believe you have the sermon. And this is on Psalm 119. And Psalm 119 uh, is the largest chapter in the Bible. It's also the um, largest psalm in the Bible. There's 172 verses or something. Yeah, I think 172. So this one is verses 9 through 16. And this is, uh, it goes according to the Hebrew alphabet. So this is the second letter, Baith, in the Hebrew alphabet. Alphabet, And, you know, we get Alpha Baith from that. Uh, Aleph Baith is Hebrew. Alpha Beta is Greek. And so we have this going on right now. Let me read uh, that for you. Let me get it up. Okay, here we go. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Okay, so Psalm 119 is focused especially uh, and specifically on God's Torah, his law, his instruction. Uh, as Lutherans, or if you're raised, uh, you know, in uh, as a Lutheran, or maybe you had a different background, but Lutherans, we, you know, understand the law. Sometimes uh, pastors will teach it that the law is bad and the gospel is good. Okay, that can be true, but here in the Psalms, and specifically Psalm 119, all 172 verses, talks about Christian living. And the position that we pray these Psalms from is one who is already saved. So we are already a person of God. And so now, the, now especially Psalm 119, how do we live out that faith to please God? Not so that we can get in good with God, not so that we can go to heaven, but because he has made us one of his dear children, a dear child. He has made us a uh, Part of his family, and he's already taking us to heaven. So that part's all set. Now, how do we live out our Christian life? Also in October, we are in what's called spiritual warfare, and uh, the readings focus on that. It's called the church militant, uh, military. You can hear that word in there. And so Satan, even though he's defeated and wounded, mortally wounded, he's not dead yet. And so with every breath he's got, he's trying to afflict the Christian church and the Christian to wrest our faith away from Christ and uh, put it in any place else but Jesus. The other favorite trick of his is to lead people to believe that he really doesn't exist. And sometimes, unfortunately, Christians even say that too. Oh, I'm a Christian, but Satan, ah, the devil's not real. But he is real, and he uses everything at his disposal. So what is, are these readings about, and how does this fit in with spiritual warfare? Well, in uh, this week, we have Ecclesiastes 5, verses 10 to 20. And Ecclesiastes 5, 10 to 20 says this, and it focuses on money and so does the gospel. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. And the Hebrew word there for vanity means vaporous. It just mist that goes away. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? In other words, you know, as the goods increase, the wealth increases, what good is it? Because all he can do is see with it, and then it's going to disappear anyway. Verse 12, sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Here now, uh, uh, the preacher is starting to contrast uh, wealthy with the poor, and really what it is, not wealthy with the poor, but those who have and, la have and labor, 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 they don't sleep well because they're always focused over here where the laborer just takes what he receives and receives, excuse me, receives what 
is given to him and he can sleep at night. Uh, where the other one, uh, the one who keeps going, 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 trying to get more, 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 is so full in his stomach that he can't sleep. Have you ever had something like that where he ate so much before bed? That's happened to me a few times where you eat a big meal, maybe Thanksgiving or Christmas or something like that. It's like hard to get to sleep. That's what this is about. So verse 13, there is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. So this is the grievous evil. It's bad enough to go seeking after these things, but then all of a sudden, you know, he's consumed by it so much so that he's got this stuff and now he bets it all and it's lost on a poor venture. That's the that's one of the worst parts, but the worst part is now, instead of using his head and faith, now he's lost everything and he can't even feed his son, his family. That's the grievous evil, okay? All the steps that led up to it are bad, but the grievous evil now is that everything he put his stock in now is gone and he can't take care of his family. Verse 15, as he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again. Naked he came and shall take nothing from his toil that he may carry away in his hand. We hear that in Job as well when Job says this. Naked into the uh, naked I came in and naked I leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord when he lost everything on that day. This verse 16 also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what ga uh, gain is there to him who toils for the wind? That's really what it's about. How can you grab the wind? You can't. Verse 17, moreover, all his days, he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps that him occupied with joy in his heart. So this is not against the rich and that the poor have it made. As you hear in verse uh, 13, uh, excuse me, 18, that uh, this is fitting. He says, behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat, drink, and find enjoyment in the toil with which one toils for a few days, etc. And then verse 19, it even says, everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions. So it's not the, the rich against the poor and the poor against the rich and pitting it on socioeconomic brackets. It's what do we do with the things that we have that God has blessed us with? Sometimes we are blessed with a lot. Sometimes we're blessed with uh, other things and not a lot of material good. This one is focused on money and stuff. And so it's not bad to have money and stuff. It's just how does our heart, our natures use them? And our sinful natures only want more, 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 more. This is also what the gospel reading focuses on. The gospel reading is Mark 10, 23 to 31. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Now, remember, this reading comes off of last week's reading, which was the uh, rich young man. Jesus, you know, he wanted to find his way to eternal life. What else must I do, teacher? Oh, why do you call me teacher? You know the commandments, thou shalt not murder, don't steal, listen to your parents, don't covet, uh, you know, uh, all these other things. And he said, all these I've kept from life, do one thing. Sell all your possessions and give it to the poor. With that, the rich man walked away. But you also notice in there that part of one of the verses is Jesus loved him. He still had compassion on this rich man. So he wants him to change his heart, change his ways so that, you know, he follows Jesus. Money and stuff get in the way. And this is what Jesus is talking about here in this gospel. He says, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible, but with God, uh, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter uh, began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. 
Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is not, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with, uh, Per, uh, with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So here as well now, the disciples weren't quite getting it either. They think it's a wealthy thing, poor thing, giving up. Uh, that earns us our way, our ticket to heaven. No, Jesus says, it's not about wealth. It's all about the heart because even they said, hey, look, Jesus, look what we all gave up. So we're pretty special now, right? We're going to get in better, right? No, is Jesus' answer. It doesn't work that way because anything that people have, as you follow Jesus, you will be persecuted because he said with persecutions, but we're also going to have wealth eternal in the age to come. And monetary stuff doesn't make a difference. It's all about God and his word in our lives. That's where Psalm 119 comes in. And I key, I'm keying off of how can a rich man keep his way pure? The answer is by guarding it according to your word. That's verse 19. Um, this is very important because as, especially as Christians, Lutheran Christians for that matter, you know, sometimes there are some who just say, no, that's all works. And it just drives me bananas because it's not works. It's good works. The psalmist and you and your children that you're going to be uh, teaching are already in a saved condition. The Holy Spirit is within us and he dwells in us and he keeps us and he works 24 seven. No union breaks, doesn't take Christmas or Easter off. So now he's working in this new person who is praying this psalm is saying to God, hey, I know my old ways. This, uh, how can a man, how can a young man keep his way pure? This word way means how now do I change my pattern of behavior? How now, since I have a new life uh, and it points forward in Christ, how now, since I am one of your dear children, God, now how do I serve you? With what power? Because my old life is in the past. Now I'm working on this new life and I'm having some struggles, God. I know that you're not, it's not going to take my standing away from you, but I still want to live out now my new way of life. It's a new pattern of behavior and a whole new look and outlook on life. So that's what the word way means. So how can a young man keep his way, his new life, his patterns of behavior, how he lives out his life pure? The answer is the next part of line uh, nine. How? Well, this is how. By guarding it according to your word. <clears throat> this word guarding is is an ethical term so it does have to do with christian living and christian ethics and it's by guarding keeping making it one's own according to your word so the word of god needs to dwell within us that's our guide we have finances that want to uh that cause us to lose sleep we have all kinds of different direction and voices out there that want to take us in different directions except for god's direction and he says, don't worry about money. Don't worry about possessions. I got it all. The Lord's Prayer starts out, our Father who art in heaven. So we approach God as our Father because he has made us his dear children. And give us this day our daily bread is the fourth petition or the fourth um, request. And this is what we're making to God. Uh, Lord, help me to trust knowing that I don't got to worry about tomorrow. You got that all in hand. You're timeless. You know what's going on. Help me, Lord, to trust you as today as you give me my daily bread. So how can a young man keep his way pure? This is how. By guarding it according to your word. And so that word pure then is only um, is used here in poetry, which is what the Psalms are, uh, in a moral sense. It means to make or keep clean and pure. And so it's to make oneself clean. So this is how we do it. We take a bath in the word and you receive that word of God in baptism. Um, it's also, you know, how do we remain righteous and things along that line? It's all with God and his word in us operating by the power of the Holy Spirit because now you and the kids are also new as well. Um, let me see what else here on this verse explains the circumstances. It's the doing of the word, the action, going out and making it its own and guarding it and then living it out. Uh, even one of the early church fathers, uh, Ambrose, mentions sort of the same things. He says, some ways 
uh, there are that we ought to follow, others as to which we ought to pay attention. We must follow the ways of the Lord and pay attention to our own ways, lest they lead us into sin. And that's what verse 11 will get into. Then he says in verse 10, with my whole heart, I seek you. It's not our heart of sin, but in baptism, we've been given that new heart, the new heart of Christ, and it's operated that way. So now he leads us, guides us. We need to open up the word. We need to read it and listen to it and let it work within us. And so uh, this is what he's praying about as well. With my whole heart, let me not wander from your commandments. See, the commandments are good, and we've got 10 of them. You can uh, kind of reference them to the kids. We have a new relationship with God's law. The word law in Hebrew is Torah, and the word Torah means instruction. And so now the Christian has a different uh, relationship with God's law, his Torah, his instruction. It no longer condemns us because Christ was condemned for us. And then he rose again and he gave us his spirit now to live out that law in our lives because he did it perfectly. It doesn't mean that we ignore them or check them out the window, but now God wants us to not wander from his commandments. And that's what uh, the psalmist is saying, because yes, it is easy still as a Christian to follow Satan's lead and voice and to wander away and sin against God. This is where verse 11 comes in. The psalmist prays, I have stored up your word in my heart. This word storing is to teach and keep this teaching close to oneself. We can't keep God's teaching close to ourselves if we don't come to church, if we don't receive the Lord's Supper, if we don't uh, go into the Word of God ourselves. It's, it's very hard to store up that Word because then our faith gets depleted and it gets drained. God needs uh, something for it to work with, and he gives it to us, and he gives it to us in his Word. And we store it up in my heart. It's that new heart of Jesus. Why? The purpose is the next part, that that I may not sin against you. We can't live perfect lives, but this is saying, hey, now that you have made me a saint, I, I don't want to sin against you. Show me your ways. What am I supposed to do and not do? Because I want to live a life of thanksgiving and praise. Money has and possessions, the kids will can relate with streaming stuff and all this other, you know, gadgets and things like that. I want more, 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 or I want the best tennis shoes, or I want this, or I want that. And we just can't always have them. And these things cause us to sin and devise ways of maybe, maybe getting them, or just as importantly, or more importantly, not being content in our lives where we are at and God has us right now. So I have stored up your word in my heart that... Here's the purpose for the story, that I might not sin against you. So it's not that it just stays here or here, but it also has to be lived out in our lives with our hands, our feet, our eyes. How do we live now for God and put other people ahead of ourselves? That was last week's sermon about teach us to number our days, O Lord, from uh, one of the Psalms. I think it was Psalm 90. And this now is how do we live it out? We're putting other people's needs above our own. But also with the gifts that God gives us, we also use these in ministry. And it's not just money, but it's also our time and our talents. Because we also have this stinginess with our time. It's my time. I work hard. I'm not going to go to church uh, because that's my one day to sleep in. Or I don't have any kind of talent to serve God. Why well, teach the kids, you know, uh, and in Bible classes, I say, God has given each uh, Christian at least two things. One is faith, which he gives to everybody. And two is fill in the blank. What can you do? What do you enjoy doing? Because that talent, 10% of the time you can use maybe to help uh, teach a, a child or a mentor or an adult or something about that skill, whether it's cooking or cleaning or, or um, you know, some might know how to raise cattle and how to slaughter them or things along that line. I don't know how to do that, but how do we get meat on the table and all these different kinds of things? How can, uh, how about photography or gardening or lawn care or fill in the blank? You know what you have, and that's, this could be something you, you could explore with the kids. Verse 12, blessed are you, Lord, teach me your statutes. So here again, now he's saying, teach me, work your life, your power in me through your Holy Spirit. And then the rest of the psalm is, you know, I will declare all the rules of your mouth, and I will do all these things. I, I 
delight in your testimonies and they're so pure and rich and all these other things. So that's where I've gone with the sermon. Um, verse 16 at the end is, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. And so an application would be, be in the word, be in your Bibles. The kids might have children's Bibles or something like that. They could ask their parents to uh, open up and read the Bible with them. Uh, maybe a children's Bible or something along that line. And this is a great way to get the Bible into use with the kids and bringing the parents together as well. Okay, I hope that this is helpful for you. It was a, a quick Bible study. As I mentioned, I had a lot of things going on, so I apologize for being a little tardy with this. I'm kind of tardy anyway, but I'm going to try to do uh, better. You've got the sermon. God's blessings to you. If you have any questions, give me a call. See you later.